All right, so Wesley, thank you very much for the introduction. As he mentioned, my name is Gabriel Sayas Caban. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And today I'm going to talk about a specific project that my lab and I have been working on, and it's titled The Evaluation of a Split Flow Model for the Emergency Department. And I should preface this that um, as I go along, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, stop me for clarification. I know there's uh, dedicated time at the end to, to ask uh, uh, more additional questions. Okay. So what I thought I would do today is start off by talking a little bit about the trajectory that led me to work in this specific project. And it started with some research I did some years ago, in fact, for my dissertation, where um, my team and I were asked to analyze um, what's known as the triage treat release program. And the triage and treat release program was implemented in an inner city hospital in Brooklyn, New York City, at the Luther Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. And it's a specific kind of uh, split flow model where uh, rather than having a nurse, you know, doing triage, they have an advanced practice practitioner like a physician or a nurse practitioner doing both triage for ED, arriving, arriving ED patients and also treatment for those low acuity, low complexity patients after triage, okay? But in that research, what I was primarily focused on was, you know, you give me a TTR system or a split flow model, and I want to sort of come up with uh, determining how should that provider at the TTR system or the triage treat release program how should they prioritize triage versus treatment, right? So if I spend all my time just triaging recently arriving patients, right, then people waiting for disposition decisions and low acuity, low complexity patients are waiting perhaps for a long time. That's not good. If I spend all my time just prioritizing treatment, then, you know, I neglect triage and there might be some pretty severe cases that I need to attend to at treatment. So, so there's perhaps a balance that we need to strike, um, uh, in order to do this, okay? Now, I won't go into too much details because this is just sort of high level and uh, overview, um, but basically what we did is we proposed um, what's known as a stochastic dynamic system, a queuing model of this triage and treatment process, a, a two-phase uh, tandem queuing system. And then with this queuing system, we proposed allocation policies using Markov decision processes, which maybe some of you have heard of, and also simulation. So that's, uh, that's what we did, and there was a couple of papers related to, um, to this work. Now, uh, you know, after working on this, sort of kind of a natural, perhaps more fundamental question arises, which is, you know, in the previous project, you know, we had the TTR system, it was already in place, and the question is, how do we come up with allocation policies that can improve perhaps system performance? But there's a question that's like, does something like the TTR system even make sense in the first place? Is this like a good system to implement in the first place? Or more specifically, can we try to determine or estimate the actual impact of something like the TTR system um, on system performance, patient outcomes, and, and so on and so forth? Does that make sense? Or kind of. And so that led us to, um, to the project that I'm going to talk about today, and, specific, and especially because our partner hospital was implementing something similar to the TTR system. Not exactly, but still a, a split flow model. Okay. Now, before I start talking about this project, you know, trying to provide high level overview of, of things that I work on. Um, so, you know, when I started my research trajectory, I, I did, I still do kind of a lot of these uh, resource allocation problems in stochastic service systems. I focus a lot in emergency department, but I've also worked in disaster response, uh, you know, a lot of stochastic modeling, optimization, simulation. And then after my postdoc at Michigan, I started kind of shifting directions to, to look at applying causal inference methods in the context of these stochastic service systems. And the idea for me was that, you know, I want to do these estimation, not simply to just estimate effects, but then also embed those estimates somehow with traditional operations research uh, and industrial engineering techniques like simulation or optimization. And so that's kind of been a little bit of my trajectory. And hopefully with the next few slides, this will become a little bit more clear. Okay. 
So let's talk about uh, the project. And I always like to start by giving credit for all those involved. And, and there's three key players in this project. The first one is my PhD student, Juan Camilo David Gomez. And this is primarily uh, his work. This is part of this dissertation. My colleague, Professor Amy Cochran, who's between the Department of Mathematics and Population Health Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Brian Patterson, who is an emergency physician, but also a tenure track faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine in the School of uh, medicine and public health at UW Mass. All right. So some uh, high level motivation by why, you know, why or why split flow models or partly why split flow models were proposed. So for those of you who don't know, you know, Americans increasingly receive acute unscheduled care in emergency departments. And one potential unfortunate consequence of this increase in practice intensity is what's known as ED crowding, right? And ED crowding is, of course, associated with uh, treatment delays. And ED crowding and treatment delays are associated with potentially bad outcomes, like increase in admission rates, um, and some of these may be preventable admissions, but also the possibility of adverse outcomes for the patient. So there's clinical studies suggesting that you know, ED crowding can increase mortality rates uh, down the road. And partly as a consequence of this, you know, many interventions have been proposed to improve patient flow and alleviate crowding. Okay, and these have been looked at in the clinical literature, of course, in the operations research and the operations management uh, literature. Okay. And one suite of interventions, which is the one I'm going to talk about today, is this split flow model. So what's a split flow model? In order for me to introduce the split flow model, I'm gonna just quickly take you through the typical patient flow in the emergency department in case you, you haven't seen this before. So in the emergency department, you know, typically a patient arrives, they register, registration, someone will collect some basic patient information like demographic information, your chief complaints. So for example, you go to the ED, you have abdominal pain or you have chest pain or syncope, uh, et cetera. And after registration, there is typically a nurse uh, who performs triage. And for those of you who don't know, triage is basically a way to assign an acuity level ba uh, based on the severity of illness. And in many hospitals in, in the U.S., they use the emergency severity index, which is like a five-point triage level algorithm. So if you're ESI level one, that means you're very critical. You need to be seen very quickly. If you're ESI level five, that means you can wait a little bit until that treatment. You're the least severe. So there's ESI level one, two, three, four, five. One being the worst, you know, you need treatment immediately. Five being the least uh, worst. And then after triage, you know, you eventually get room in, a, in an ED bed or, or some room, and there's a, a care provider or a team of care providers who will monitor you, treat you. They might provide some labs, uh, medication, uh, until they're sufficiently sure that you can either be safely discharged home or admitted into an inpatient hospital. And this is what I'm terming, you know, there might be deviations in different hospitals, but this is what I'm going to call today the traditional ED patient pool. So there's not a lot of pictures in this talk. I'm really sorry about that. But I just, before I move on, this is, makes sense. This, this is one of the, my wife always, you know, when I show her the slides, she gets really excited. Goes, oh, you have some pictures, finally, you know. So, uh, so but I just want to make sure for those of you who are a little less familiar uh, with ED, that this makes sense. This is, Okay, so what's split flow? So split flow starts off the same way as in our previous model. You know, the patient arrives, they register. But now, instead of having a nurse, they have an advanced practice practitioner at patient intake. So the first sort of uh, encounter that they have with a care provider is not a nurse, but, a, but a, a physician or a nurse practitioner or something like that, okay? And, and this is important because what someone who implements this model would argue is that the, this model will improve patient flow because this physician at patient intake does two things. The first one is uh, early task initiation. So they can initiate the care of the patient by placing lab imaging orders or medication orders. And the second one is uh, one that's also 
common in the OR literature is they stream patients. So after they do this initial patient intake, they're going to stream patients into two flows. The first flow, which is the one at the top, is for those patients who are low complexity, low acuity, and they have a separate sort of fast track area where they get treated by, by this, this physician that's doing the, the intake. And the second flow is um, those patient, the patients that go through the traditional flow, they're slightly more severe, they maybe need a more complicated workup, so they get streamed to this normal bed, a traditional bed. Okay. And then after that, things proceed as they were before. For both patients in either stream, you know, they have to make a disposition decision or an admission decision. And after that, they either go home or some other level of care outside the hospital or they get admitted into an inpatient hospital. So does that make sense? Okay. All right. And so what I'm, what we did, um, is that, and I want to emphasize is we're going to bid split flow as a single intervention. Okay. We're going to bid split flow as a single intervention, but know that it has two main components that can potentially help with patient flow. One is that early task initiation, which I, this is the, the practitioner triage, I'm calling it. And the second one is the streaming mechanism. Now, it turns out that, uh, you know, the, the clinical literature has, uh, you know, studied both from a qualitative and quantitative uh, point of view, you know, the effects of split flow uh, and its impact or the associations between split flow and, and some outcomes, which should be operational, like length of stay, quality, or safety metrics. Um, but at least when this study came out, uh, what was not been analyzed is, is how to determine what's the direct impact of split flow uh, on patient outcomes, operational outcomes. And that's what we, what we wanted to do. We wanted to use causal inference methodology to try to establish a more direct relationship between split flow and some outcomes. Okay. So we had two um, objectives. The first one is estimate direct, or perhaps we're gonna call it causal impact of split flow on outcomes, and I'll come back to this in a second. And now suppose that we do estimate some effects, right? Uh, maybe it comes back, depending on the outcome that you're measuring, it comes back that split flow is really good for patient flow. Well, we wanna sort of try to find out what the reason for that is, okay? So what's the mechanism that's driving the observed or the estimated uh, effects? So what are the, the outcomes that we're going to focus on? So there's two sets. One's operational outcomes. The other one is patient outcomes. For the operational outcomes, I'm going to focus on time to be room, and that's going to be the time from when the patient arrives to when they get assigned either to a traditional bed or to a space or room in the vertical area, the fast track area. So that's time to be roomed. And the second one is time to disposition, which is the time from when the bed is assigned to when the disposition decision uh, is made. So those are going to be my operational outcomes that we're going to look at. And of course, this is time, so it's a continuous, this is going to be an outcome, it's a continuous uh, variable. Does that make sense? And then for patient outcomes, we looked at admission rates. So how is in, uh, split flow impacting, you know, uh, the decision to admit or not, the probability of admitting? And finally, um, ED revisits. Okay. Now, how many of you have heard of what an ED revisit is? Students, mostly. <laughs> You have heard of, you have a single <laughs> raise their hand. So ED revisits refers to, um, you know, when the patient leaves the ED, they come back, you know, within a certain time frame. So that's, uh, they come back. Um, and, and the idea is, you know, if you specify a time window, say 30 day ED revisit, you want, you know, the hospital is interested in how many patients come back to the ED after leaving the ED within third, three days. Uh, and the idea behind measuring that outcome is that it could be, though there's some debate about this, that that's an indicator of uh, quality of service in the ED. And so that's why 
uh, you know, uh, hospitals and, and physicians uh, care about this outcome. At least that's my understanding uh, of that. So, so we are looking at ED revisits because it's supposed to be a proxy for the quality of care that patients receive in the ED. And if it happens too quickly, that may be, that may be bad. So these are our objectives, and of course, you know, we want to do something, and, and, and you know, there's obviously challenges, right? And, and so those are what I'm going to highlight next. So the first challenge, as you can imagine, is that for those of you who sort of follow the mainstream news, you know, you want to test the effectiveness of some pharmaceutical, right? So you conduct a, a randomized trial to, you know, give some patients placebo, you give other patients uh intervention, right? And this assignment is uh, randomized, and that's how you find the causal effect of this pharmaceutical product or something like that. Uh, and thinking analogously to that, one challenge to estimating effects is, of course, patients aren't randomized to a split flow model, right? You, you can't, somebody arrives, okay, well, let's, I'm going to flip a coin, and then you go to split flow, and then I flip a coin, you go through a separate, at least from the observational data that we have. And so what that implies is that there may be factors that confound the relationship between the intervention, split flow, and the outcomes that we're interested in measuring, okay? So to give you an example, um, you know, you may suspect that, uh, you know, younger adults have shorter uh, time to disposition times, right? If in addition, then sort of shorter time to disposition times relative to their older counterparts, if, in addition, they're more likely to arrive during split flow hours, right, can you really attribute, you know, shorter or average, shorter average times to disposition decision to split flow itself, or is it the fact that younger patients all arrive after split flow starts, right? So age is confounding the relationship between split flow and that particular outcome in this case. Does that... Make sense? So that's one challenge, right? So we, we need to do some, some, some work there. And then the second one is a little bit less challenging, which is for objective two, you know, what are the potential causes that are driving the observed effects? So, and, and I'm going to call these uh, mediators because what we did to accomplish objective two is a mediation analysis. All right, and what we're going to do to try to overcome these objectives is apply what's known as causal inference methodology for observational data. I have data from our partner hospital, and we're going to try to do this for, for observational data. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So what's the causal inference technique that we're going to uh, apply? Uh, so what we did is we uh, implemented what's known as a regression discontinuity design. So to achieve, so to estimate the effects, we're going to uh, implement what's known as a regression discontinuity design. And the reason for this, uh, and perhaps what makes it a little bit uh, unusual from the traditional RD design, is that split flow operates during specific times of the day, each day of the week in our partner hospitals, from 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. each day. And then for the second uh, objective, uh, determining, you know, what's the, the cause behind the observed effects, we implement a mediation analysis to test the degree to which these estimated effects can be attributed to two mediator variables. One is the time to first order because it captures the hypothesized benefits of this early task initiation that I was talking a lot about in the beginning of the presentation. Right. So if, if split flow does reduce time to disposition uh, or we find that, that the uh, split flow causes a shorter time to disposition time, um, is it because the physician is ordering things earlier in the process? That's really... Uh, you know, that could be one reason. And then the other one is time to be room, which is also, um, also an outcome, but it can also be a mediator. And the reason we included this as a mediator is because we hypothesize that uh, a longer time to be room, because the physician is spending more time with the physician up front, 
can lead to, to shorter time to disposition after. So if the physician's spending a lot of time trying to sort of maybe diagnose, look what's wrong with the patient, maybe that leads to a, a shorter uh, time to disposition. So now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try to formalize this a little bit, and I am going to introduce some, some notations, some variables. Um, if at any point, you know, you have any questions, you know, please raise your hand and, and uh, try to clarify as much as I can. Okay. And by the way, I'm, you know, I, I'm sort of using this as a kind of a, because I, when I was preparing for this talk, I was trying to find, you know, obviously this is my work. I'm very proud of it, you know, and my student and all that. But also I, it's kind of a nice way to talk about sort of causal inference, you know, introduce if you haven't seen it before, uh, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, any questions, please just place your hand. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to introduce some notation for our outcome of interest. So I'm going to let Y be our random outcome of interest. So this could be the operational outcomes, which are continuous, or the binary outcomes, which are the patient outcomes. Uh, so it could be either of those. And then I'm going to introduce a capital A to denote the intervention assignment. So if capital A equals zero, uh, it means uh, no split flow. If capital A equals one, it means um, split flow. And then third, and, and this is a very important, you know, concept in, in causal inference, is I'm going to introduce the random potential outcome. So I'm going to denote this by Y superscript A. And that's going to be uh, the outcome if the patient were to be assigned to intervention little a. Okay. So Y superscript 1 is the outcome if the patient were assigned to split flow, and Y superscript 0 is the outcome if the patient were assigned not to split. The traditional flow. Now, in in causal inference, right? Um, as I understand it, you know, we want to say so to measure causal effects, we need to say something about the distribution of the two potential outcomes. Okay. And what I'm going to highlight in a second is that you know. One of these guys is missing, so how can we say something about both potential outcomes for each patient if one of these guys is missing? And that's going to lead us into identification strategies of causal effects. Okay. So first, the random outcome is going to equal the random potential outcome if the intervention assignment, capital A, matches the corresponding uh, intervention. So if the treatment assignment is no split flow, so A equals zero, then the observe or the, the outcome of interest equals the random potential outcome of Y superscript zero, and it's going to be the same when A equals uh, one. So we want to measure effects. That requires that we say something about this Y superscript A, but as you can note, you know, Take me, for example, if I go to the ED today, right, um, I'm either admitted or not admitted, right, at this specific point in time. I can't be both, right? I can't be admitted and not admitted, right, to the ED. So in terms of observing these random potential outcomes, we really only observed one of them. The other one is missing. This is why it's a counterfactual, right? Right, so if I go to the ED, I can either be admitted or not, or sorry, I can either receive split flow or not split flow, but I can't, I mean, I could do both if I just come back after the ED and that's manipulating, you know, your treatment assignment, but that's, but I can either do split flow or not split flow for that specific visit at that point in time. I can't do both. So causal inference, we want to say something about Y superscript one, Y superscript zero, but for each Visit, we only have one of the two, so the other one is missing. So that's one thing I want to note. And the second one, you know, so, so, that, so we have a missing random potential outcome, right? So one way to perhaps save this, right, in order to estimate effects is to say, well, if the random potential outcome has the same distribution as my observed outcome, given the intervention, then I can estimate effects. 
but this turned out to be not necessarily true. And the reason for this is because we're not randomizing the intervention. So the random potential outcome Y superscript A may not have the same distribution as the observed outcome given the intervention. And the reason for that is because we're not randomizing patients to, uh, if that randomization is due appropriately, patients to split flow. And this is kind of like, in a sense, a fundamental problem of causal inference, right? What we're going to do next is we're going to impose conditions under which we can use the observed outcome given the treatment assignment to say something about the causal effects, which involves the, poten the random potential outcomes, Y superscription. And these are known as identifiability conditions in causal inference. Questions? All right. So, what are these? Um, so, what are these conditions? Uh, so, before I state those, I have to introduce just a little bit more notation. First one is going to be um, the arrival time for each patient. I'm going to call that capital T. T little t zero, little t one are going to be the start and end of split flow. And with this notation, now I can say something important that we're going to need for RD assumptions, which is that A is going to be a deterministic function of the arrival time. In other words, if, say, you arrive between, uh, say you arrive at 12.05 p.m., do you get split flow or not? Yes. Right, because split flow starts from 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. So if I know my arrival time, right, then I know that A is going to be 1 because I arrive between 12 p.m. and 9 p.m. Conversely, you know, if I arrive at 9 a.m., A is going to equal what? Zero. Okay. Now, to make the notation a little bit uh, simpler, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the random arrival time, subtract from it the start of the care start time, T0. And keep in mind that T0 is really just 12 p.m., okay? So I'm going to center around uh, the cutoff, the, the start of uh, split flow time. All right, so I have all the notation I need. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the identifiability, and then I'm going to start presenting... Uh, some results. So we're interested in estimating rho. What is rho? It's the conditional mean of the difference of the two potential outcomes when I have the intervention and I don't have the intervention. Condition on the fact that the arrival time is at the start of split flow. Now, what did we say before? One of these two uh, random potential outcomes is missing. So how do we calculate this, this rho? How do we calculate this expectation. Well, we're going to need some assumptions. The first one, uh, and you know, you can forget about the limits, I'll just tell you in words, is basically saying that there is a discontinuity in the intervention assignment. Meaning, you know, if you arrive before 12, you don't get split flow. If you arrive after 12, you get split flow. So that's clearly a discontinuity because that function A is zero until 12 p.m. and then one after after uh, 12 p.m. So that's just saying there's a discontinuity. The second one is a little bit more uh, tricky to uh, interpret, it. Uh, but the idea here is saying basically that the conditional mean of the potential outcome is continuous at the time of the uh, start of the split flow, and essentially this is done to guarantee that you don't break identifiability. In other words, one way to in which this condition will not hold is if you have patients that, you know, a priori to say, well, I'm going to go to the ED at 1 p.m. because I know physician, you know, Wesley is actually the attending physician and I want to get treated by Wesley, so I'm going to arrive at 1. I'm just going to hold my pain and arrive at 1. Or conversely, you really like the nurse that's being stationed on Monday uh, and so you say, well, I'm going to go at 9 a.m. before 12 because, uh, you know, I like this particular nurse. This is called manipulating your treatment assignment. And if that happens, you know, on average, then uh, you can't estimate effects, you know, because you're manipulating your treatment. And so this is no longer continuous there. Okay. 
that was a little bit more abstract, but let me stop here. So this one we can check because we have a functional form for A. This one you cannot check analytically. All you can do is some you know, graphical tests empirically to make sure that people aren't manipulating their treatment and, and the citations I provided above give kind of a guide for how to, how to do that and we did that in the paper. So you can only empirically uh, check that, okay? You can't like analytically, you know, it's not a proof, you know. So if I have these two assumptions, then I can write this row as a difference of two limits, y plus and y minus. Y plus is the limit as, uh, as the arrival time gets close to split flow from the right of the conditional mean of the observed outcome given the, uh, the arrival time. And Y minus is the limit as the start at the arrival time approaches care start from the left, so from morning to noon of the conditional mean of the observed outcome given the arrival time. So what do you notice about, so whatever comes to mind, what do you notice about this and this? So this and this expression compared to this expression. So what do you see here, right? You see this. Y superscript one and Y superscript zero, right? So I see the potential outcomes. And here I have these two limits and do you see the random potential outcomes there? So remember, there's the outcome, the, and I'm going to call them observe outcome, for, for, and then there's the random potential outcome. Is this the random potential outcome or the random outcome? Yeah, it's the random outcome. And all I'm, uh, very good. Okay, great. Okay, so all I want to say now is that I took rho, which depended on something that was missing, right? And now I replaced it with something that depends on the observed outcome that's, uh, we can estimate using regression, you know, so it's not, not missing in a sense anymore. So I, I, so this rho doesn't depend on my potential outcomes anymore. They depend on the conditional mean of y and conditional mean of y here. All right. Hey, oh, yeah. Can I ask you a, a yeah. question? Why are we focusing on zero, exactly the moment when things change? Yeah. So, so remember, so that's a very good question. So Wesley asked, why are we focused on uh, zero? So basically the local average treatment effect at the start. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so the identification strategy is that um, we have a discontinuity. Right? So we don't have a randomized trial. What we have is a discontinuity at the tar start of care start on the treatment assignment. Right? But even though we don't have a randomized trial, um, it could be the case that the patients who are arriving right before the start of care start are similar to the patients that arrive right after the start of care start. And then these two set of patients are exchangeable. They're similar. So I can compare sort of apples to apples and oranges to oranges. That's, that's the idea of the, the RD design, uh, you know. Yeah. And that's the continuity assumption here, which is basically saying we, you know, there's nothing we are going on near the cutoff. We need that to be smooth, you know. All right. Any other questions? All right, so let me kind of give you uh, another picture. Uh, and here, just to kind of maybe highlight in, in sort of, uh, this is gonna come in when we talk about regression in a second. So here I'm plotting in the uh, x-axis, the arrival time. So when a patient arrives, uh, right? Uh, in the middle of that x-axis, I have uh, the split flow start time, 12 p.m. So that's in the middle here. 
Uh, right? And then in the y-axis, I'm going to plot a uh, mean conditional on arrival time of four different things. The first one is the conditional uh, mean of the realized outcome. So that's why this is curve right here is bolded. Okay, it's conditional mean. Then here I'm plotting the conditional mean of the potential outcome. That's why it's uh, you know not a bolded line here. Here I'm plotting the conditional mean of A, but this is a deterministic function of the arrival time, so it's really zero here, and it's one here. Here I'm plotting the conditional mean of the potential outcome uh, when uh, split flow happens, and here is the realized, the mean of the realized outcome after split flow happens. And what essentially these identification strategies are saying is that if something like this figure is happening, then I can estimate the effect or the average causal effect as the jump between this curve right here and this curve right here. It is continuous around, so that's how I can uh, estimate the, uh, the average causal effect. And so that gives you an idea for how to sort of estimate now effects, which is basically you kind of, you do, uh, you know, for the, for the patients that, the outcome of the patients that arrive like around the bandwidth of the start of care start for the patients, you throw a regression, right? A reg say a regression line. And then you throw a separate regression line for the, uh, the realized outcomes of the patients that are right, right after split flow. And then the jump between those two curves at the start of split flow really is the, the estimated effect. That's really uh, what that is. That makes sense. That's true. and that's all the causal inference. Oh, yeah, please. How would this change if the rate Yeah, so then uh you know, so basically you would have some kind of uh discontinuity here that sort of so it's not like smooth. Uh Yeah, so, so two questions here. The first one is if I shift, so given the, these curves, right, and, and these assumptions that are embedded in this curve, if I shift the start of split flow, you know, is it still, can I still interpret whatever results from that curve and this old curve, right? Uh, can I still interpret that as the causal effect? That's the first. And the answer is uh, not necessarily. You know, you still need the assumptions around the start. So if I move to the left and it all, all of a sudden, you know, it's not continuous anymore or the treatment assignment, in this case, the treatment assignment is not discontinuous. Uh, well, it's still discontinuous or something like that changes that that may not be the causal. So you have to look at the curve. If you shift the, treat, uh, the start of split flow to the left, you still have to look at these curves to make sure that it's continuous. Uh, there. Okay. Now the second question is about you know perhaps how does this effect change by you know uh, you know there's a lot of things happen in the ED you know there's uh, shift changes there's a handoff process uh, it's busy uh, and for that I'll talk a little bit more about that how we sort of um, we did a moderation analysis to to see how. Um, how the estimated effects change with, you know, different congestion levels. Like, is it more effective when congestion is low? Is it that kind of thing? We also adjust it for the physician who's doing split flow. You know, is that maybe, you know, is it because, is split flow effective because the really fast physician is always a patient uh, intake or not? So we did some sensitivity analysis to that. We also, uh, looked at what happens during shift changes, you know, is that really affecting, uh, so we did some sensitivity to, to a lot of those things. And of course, nothing is definitive, but you want to check. Every patient is right after the split flow and after the split Yeah, that's correct. But I've seen that every time Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so there you, so it's another a way into doing, you know, causal effect estimation is to use, uh, you know, instrument variable approach. And there is a relationship between RD design and the instrument variable. In particular, this is, uh, the nice thing about RD is that, uh, you know, it's just for unmeasured compounding, uh, which is what instrument variable, uh, you know, is used for, uh, in estimating causal effect. The instrument is something that's related to the, uh, intervention, but not the outcome. Only it's only related to the outcome only via the intervention. Uh, and if you have certain conditions, then then this instrument, you know, adjusts for unmeasured compounding. Yeah. Yeah. So so so, so that's the, the encouragement. You know, part. it's like you have to check you know, people empirically. You know, like you don't see a lot of. You know, like, if you see, for example, a lot of older, like 65 year olds coming around this time, then there's something weird going on. And you have to, you know, you can't guarantee identifiability, but you can only check that guard. Or, or if acuity level three, all of them are arriving right at a, you know, time window, then there's something strange going on and you have to check, you know, then it's not so clear that that continuity assumption. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the estimation here, but the idea of the identification strategy is that at the cutoff here, the patients that arrive in the non-intervention and the intervention are similar. Yeah, so we don't need, I mean, you can always improve estimates by doing matching, you know, you can always do that, you know, but, but, but we didn't do that. Uh, but, but the idea of the identification strategy is that if these hold, right, the patients arriving right before, patients arriving right after, we can't really know what the size of that bandwidth is, but so you do sensitivity analysis, but they're supposed to be similar or matched. In a way. Yeah. All right, so let me quickly talk about the estimation, and there's kind of just a notation here. So now we have identification, and now we want to estimate effects from data. And what we do is we assume a model on both sides of the cutoffs for the conditional uh, mean given the arrival time. So it's going to be some function when uh, split flow, uh, before the start of split flow, it's going to be some other function plus a constant after the start of split flow. So that's the second part here. And the only requirement is that F, zero and F1 are continuous functions. So for example, we can use like linear functions. So this would be linear regression in that case. And that they're equal at S equals zero. And if the two assumptions that I mentioned hold, right, in the vicinity or bandwidth around the start of um, split flow, then we estimate the effect by letting rho equal this uh, gamma right here. So we can interpret that to be the, the causal effect. Now, note that, you know, we don't know what is, you know, the right bandwidth, so, uh, or what's the right uh, continuous function we should use here, like polynomials, right? So we do sensitivity to both the bandwidth selection and then um, the polynomial uh, that's given. Okay. So that's it, no more notation. So here's some, some results that, that we have, okay? So we had, so this is a, a project with our partner hospital, um, and we had some electronic healthcare records spanning roughly about two years. And after applying exclusion criteria, the remaining sample was roughly about 21,000 or 22,000 uh, uh, visits that were used for um, analysis. Okay. And what I want to focus is on our four main outcomes that I mentioned in the beginning and the bandwidth of one hour. So those things that are, uh, are bold here. And the first thing to note is that we estimated that split flow increases the time to be room by roughly about 4.6 uh, minutes. So that's the first estimate. The second one is that it decreases the time to disposition decision by about 14.4 um, minutes. 
So the effect, if I add those up, um, the effect on length of stay, if you count length of stay, the time from when arrival happens to when the disposition decision happens is about 9.8. So a reduction in their length of stay of about 9.8 uh, minutes. Surprisingly, which is something we didn't expect, uh, split flow uh, leads to, or is estimated to lead to a decrease in the emission rates. So the emission rate decreased by 5.8%. Uh, and then finally, it seemed to have no effect on, uh, you know, so the confidence interval in growth is zero here. So it seemed to have no effect on 30-day uh, uh, revisit rates. So we estimated um, that it reduces length of stay by about 9.8 minutes, uh, reduces emission rates, it has no impact on uh, revisit rates. Do you have some assessment of the front of the federal commission to the security and not security? Yeah, very good. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's my, yeah. Leads perfectly into the next slide. Yeah. All right, so I have a good question here about how, how these effects, in other words, are moderated by different uh, you know, characteristics. And so I just wanted to quickly highlight a few things. And one of them I'm going to skip. I won't talk too much about it. Uh, which is, uh, we did sensitivity to bandwidth selection, uh, interference between, uh, patients, operational confounders, which our colleague here pointed out. For example, who is the provider at triage? Uh, is it, you know, is the effect due to how do you handle physician shift changes? Is it due to that? Uh, what happens at the split flow end time, you know, uh, things like, things like that. But also we did moderation by many different characteristics, including congestion, chief complaint, uh, physician workload, and, uh, the severity of, of the, the patients. And so here's kind of a sample of results. This is not, there's just a lot of results, uh, here that I'm going to present. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on these. So on the leftmost column, I have different moderators, congestion, chief complaint, ESI, which is a measure of severity, uh, the severity of illness, right? Uh, and the different uh, levels, two different levels, okay? So the congestion when it's uh, medium and high, so I split those into turtiles, chief complaint, abdominal pain, chest pain. These are the two most common chief complaints we observe. And ESI group three, four, and five. And remember, the ESI level four and five are those patients that are uh, not so severe. They, they don't require a lot of, uh, they can wait a little bit longer. And those are precisely the patients that are getting sent to the uh, vertical or fast track area. Okay. So a couple of things I wanted to highlight. First is that relative to low congestion, uh, you know, uh, split flow seems to reduce time to be room for both medium and high congestion. But when congestion is high relative to, um, to low congestion, it actually increases the time to disposition decision. Okay. And so if I add those two effects of time to disposition decision and time to be room here, I actually get uh, an effect of zero. So split flow doesn't, uh, has no effect on length of stay when the congestion in the ED is uh, very high. And we think that, you know, at high congestion level, there is sort of a, there's a constraint on the, it puts a constraint on the, on the throughput of the ED, you know. So we think that, you know, too many tests have been ordered. Uh, so it's like oversaturated uh, in a sense. So. The second thing I wanted to highlight related to severity is that uh, relative to the more severe groups, uh, Split flow seems is estimated to lead to uh, a reduction of roughly 21 minutes for time to disposition for those low severity, low uh, sorry, those low severity patients. Okay. So, so they're they're you know they're they're being left out of the the hospital uh, you know quicker, and that's a good thing because it means that um, based on this estimate, which is for abdominal pain patients that these patients, which are, you know, abdominal pain patients are complicated patients to, to diagnose and sometimes to treat, uh, they seem to be getting to 
a bed, which is what we think they need, quicker. So those are sort of a few highlights of, you know, uh, this is important to, to, you know, check, you know, where's the effect happening. Any questions? Or? Yeah, Sorry. Uh, so you said that you can inform the users of the effect and 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 the effect the uh, uh, average mediation effects. So remember, we have two mediators. It's the one related to early task initiation. The other one is uh, time to be roomed. Okay, so we can uh, define the average mediation effects in a rigorous uh, way. I skip those here. But what I wanted to highlight is, you know, once you do this formal identification uh, exercise and you specify a, a model of regression to estimate uh, mediation effects. You can get some results, and I just really wanted to, you know, just talk about it and sort of tell you what you can do and, and what it represents. So remember that we saw an estimated reduction of 14.4 14 point, 14 point minutes for time to disposition decision after being roomed. Okay. Do you remember that? So with mediation, this type of mediation analysis and focusing on the outcome for time to disposition decision, what this number is telling me is that the mediator time to first order or the early task initiation mediator is uh, responsible for two minutes out of that 14.4 uh, reduction. And I'm just simply trying to highlight what you can do kind of with uh, mediation analysis uh, here. Yeah. Of course, there are some assumptions made there that, you know, you have to check sensitivity and, and, uh, and all these kinds of things. But just to introduce this concept of mediation analysis. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So, um, so let me just quickly um, uh, summarize. Uh, you know, we tried to estimate the impact of split flow, found a sort of a, a 9.8 minute reduction in ED length of stay. Um, and we did sensitivity analysis and moderation. And remember, I had this slide, one of my few pictorial slides, where I sort of said, okay, I used to work in resource allocation, I switched to causal inference, applied causal inference. And I'm trying to integrate, you know, resource allocation or, or uh, the estimates into traditional, you know, OROM tools and techniques like simulation and optimization. And so what we did sort of uh, as a last thing is that we um, implemented these estimated effects in a simulation model that's fed from the data of uh, the study ED. Okay. And here's some kind of very simple results, and I'll go through them pretty quickly, but please stop me if, if something doesn't make sense. So we ran a discrete event simulation model of the study ED, assuming certain uh, you know, parameters, distributions, and so on and so forth. And we looked at uh, total occupancy. We also looked at the occupancy uh, at phase two service, which means all those patients that are either in a vertical area or in a main room ED. And then we looked at the occupancy of only those room patients. So I'm taking out uh, those that are in the vertical area in this last uh, there. Okay. I report results in turtiles. So, you know, what's the, what's the occupancy when congestion is low, medium, and high, low, medium, and high? And I compare the traditional flow versus the split. Yeah. Oh, five minutes. Oh, sorry. thank you. Okay. So I'll stop right after this. Yeah. So from the first three rows, you see that there's really not a huge significant difference in um, you know, how many people are in the ED, right? So, so that's not changing too much based on the simulation model where I'm implementing the estimated effects from my previous slide. Uh, but if you look at the occupancy of phase two, that includes both the vertical area and the main room ED, you do see now some reduction in the occupancy as a result of the split flow model. So you see that this is lower than this. This is you know, slightly lower than this. This is a little bit higher. So for low and medium congestion, this is the case. And then finally, for occupancy of room patients, uh, split flow actually um, is increasing. 
And so what we take that to mean is that um, these, uh, so, the, so the room patients is increasing. What we take that to mean is that split flow is getting those low acuity, low complexity patients out of the system uh, quicker. And so that perhaps is allowing the more complicated patients to, to get to a bed that they need. Okay, so uh, I did have a couple of, you know, so I, the point of this talk, I try to sort of make it a little bit about, you know, uh, my journey into causal inference. I do have some additional examples of other work that I'm doing, but I am going to stop now, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, any questions you may have uh, about this or any other thing. So anyway, thank you very much for hosting me. It's been a really nice visit. Uh, you know, Hanover, Dartmouth is a, just a beautiful University, special thanks to Amos Johnson for, for helping out with all the arrangements and, of course, to Wesley Marrero for hosting me. And it's very nice to meet all the students and, and the faculty that I, I met today. So thank you very much. So I can